It's London Heathrow Terminal 3 again. Normally I say that when I haven't been at the airport for a week, but this time I was here yesterday and after a day in the lounges, my British Airways flight went pop as it taxied to the runway and so I had a lovely comfortable evening at the hotel at Terminal 4. Well, I'm back here again and coming up, all the One World Business Class lounges. From British Airways to Cathay Pacific to American Airlines and then back to Qantas again as I stagger around London Heathrow Terminal 3. I'll be trying all the champagne so you don't have to and finding out just what is the worst lounge at Heathrow. Yesterday was an episode of trying to escape from Heathrow and trying to avoid four lounges and a cancellation trolley. Instead of jetting my way over the North Sea yesterday, I got a hotel voucher from British Airways. Now, if you were a gold card holder, they put you up in the Crown Plaza. Business class, you got the Holiday Inn Express. And everybody in economy, they were told to try the Premier Inn, pay for it themselves and try and claim it through BA. Well, morning has broken like the first morning, yesterday. Speedbird has spoken like the first time we tried to get aloft. Does that sound like a hymn? Well, I'm praying we're actually going to make it on board a plane or something today. There's the famous BA Delay breakfast in the Holiday Inn Express. If you hunt for it, you might find a sausage. There are starving hordes after, it's got to be said, a lot of drinking last night. Still, never mind, I can get a second breakfast and possibly a first lunch in the lounge. And here we go, back for a second attempt. Well, here we are at Terminal 3 again. I've got high hopes that this, the day after yesterday, which turned out so badly, will turn out to be a better day. There are certainly some more lounges to explore and you never know, we might even get on an aircraft. I'm crossing my fingers, let's go. Right, okay, what are we going to do today? Uh, let's try a lounge we haven't done yet. How about British Airways? The again. Uh, quite frankly, by this point, I was past the point of caring, so um, British Airways can also offer up a business class lounge in the Silver Bar. I'm going to give that a go. And I'm actually quite glad I did, because it's had some new furniture and a new carpet again, and it's looking fairly squish. A good job too, as I certainly wasn't after 24 hours drinking my way around Terminal 3. Now, I think British Airways has done a great job revamping the lounge, and let's face it, it was well overdue. The old refectory style tables by the entrance have gone, and instead they're smaller tables with a few chairs, but there are noticeably fewer of them. There are even some of British Airways' new solo chairs. They look very similar to the one that Cathay Pacific have got. And get this, there's a brand new Bottega Prosecco bar and a little fridge with good Hampshire ice cream. Unfortunately, the glass wall bottle racks are still there and more than ever, it looks like a 1990s pizza chain. But you can pour yourself a glass of bubbly and it's probably hair of the dog for me. There's plenty of wine in the silver bar. BA is still promoting the rosé and annoyingly has just got toothpaste glasses, not proper wine glasses today. The lounge is light and bright on a sunny morning. In fact, the light's so bright, I've got to wear shades. It's quite possibly BA's sunniest lounge at Heathrow. I checked out the new British Airways catering in the Terminal 3 lounge and it's gone up market on the business class side with vastly better salads than a few years ago. And get this, the curry is no longer are put out in long trays of slots, but instead in proper pots. It's taken British Airways a decade to tweak it looks better, although it's always good not to rush these things. 
which it's perfect just before a short haul flight around Europe. Now I know some of our international visitors turn their noses up at it, particularly the bacon sarnas and porridge in breakfast, but clearly they don't appreciate British culinary sophistication. There are quite a few sort of wire-framed bookshelves with copies of High Life. Sun's well over the yard arm, so afternoon tea makes an appearance, and the type of cakes that were previously just in first are now drifting down to business class. Just as I drifted over to the bar for a couple more glasses of rosé. The red wines are of the 10 to 15 quid in Tesco variety, but not that bad in context. There's also some Speedbird Lager in the fridge in cans. Yep, on the departure board there's a stark reminder of my disaster from yesterday. Do watch episode one where I thought I was going to be flying to Gothenburg and just checked out a couple of lounges. Instead, I checked out four lounges at Heathrow Terminal 3, got on a plane and then it went pop on the taxiway just before we got to the runway. Well, this time I've got to get a wiggle on and get out of here as there are just two more lounges to go to complete my trump card set of all the One World lounges at Terminal 3. It really feels like I'm in purgatory waiting for the ferryman to turn up. No, not Christopher, but actually Sisyphean. And if you need to ask what that task is, you've obviously never been stuck for days at Terminal 3. I'll give you a hint in case you aren't up to speed on the latest Greek mythology. Sisyphus was stuck in the underworld watching his luggage roll down a hill for eternity, which is often a good analogy for Heath Woe. But I don't have eternity, I only have four hours until my fright, I mean flight, departs and, oh look, more lounges. Let's take a sharp left turn from Lounge F to today's letter C, which stands for Cafe Pacific. But this time I'm going to slum it with a hoi polloi on the business class side. I was determined to endure what is, after all, a glorified waiting room as stoically as I could. But you know what? This is brilliant! Cathay is so far from pathetic in business, indeed it's hard to believe this isn't a first-class lounge. There are fantastic solo seats with great views of the runway, lovely squishy sofas, an amazing small pantry area with refectory. Please do try not to call it the canteen or staff will give you an odd sideways look and call in a flunky. And just check out the cocktail bar. Right, let's get a wine. I might just survive and take it over to those fantastic solo seats. And time to relax and get over the deep-seated psychological trauma of yesterday's flight making it to the runway, but not up into the sky. You know, I started out 24 hours ago planning to check out all seven lounges from One World at London Heathrow. 24 hours later, I'm still here and still working my way through them. Currently here in the Cafe Pacific Business Class Lounge. And for a business class lounge, it really is superb. I can't fault this at all. But you know, at some point in the next few days, I'd like to avoid four lounges and a cancellation trolley and actually get on board a flight. Now, if I ever design my drawing room to look like an airline lounge, it might just look like this, with, of course, a morning room looking like the first-class side. The little pantry area is superb, and this really shows the art and design from Ills Crawford, and it's pretty similar to its larger siblings in Hong Kong. Of course, plenty of bread and pastries. You don't get the niceties of the first side, like the olives plucked from the fields of Tuscany and ferried by serfs who did pay the ferrymen. But it's totally adequate. At least they still feed you if you're forced to slum it in business class, and the sandwiches are far from British Rail. 
but there's one reason why I'm heading back to Cathay Pacific. It's all about the bar. I'm taking it easy by just working my way through the wine list. There's an excellent Chardonnay that complements a Sauvignon Blanc I had earlier and four very good reds I'm going to sample in a minute. And yet the lounge gets even better. After all, where else at Heathrow can you get a made-to-order noodle bar just as you get in Kowloon? It's a fixture in Cafe Pacific lounges. You can select a Hargo, Dandan Mien, Wonton Noodles, or even a Slurpee Ramen and slurp it at the noodle bar. Then top it off with condiments straight from Asia. But I can't afford to linger longer and loiter, putting my feet up in business. There's one more lounge to go, the holy grail of my search for a perfect redemption, and tick off all seven One World lounges at Heathrow Terminal 3. Let's head for the last lounge on the list. Lounge H standing for holy moly, what are they doing? I was once again forced to resort to the intervention at the AA. Now, American may be a fine airline, or at least staggering up into the realms of tolerably acceptable compared to the pits of despair it was in a decade back. But one thing, or as many passengers do argue, one of the many things, it cannot do is airline lounges. I mean, just look at it. It's rather like an out of work motorway service station, and that's being kind. After the horror of yesterday and the American first class lounge, just check it out in part one for details, I couldn't believe it could get any worse. Oh, how wrong I was. I was once again in the land of purgatory waiting for the ferryman to get me to the other side. Next up, if we can find it, food. And goodness knows what horrors those in business get if they reach out to AA. But I know, because I've seen the preview of First just yesterday. No, this is the delight that American Airlines serve up on their most premium of routes. Yeah, it's not all bad. The sandwiches are just about edible and, ooh, look, olives. But the Minions obviously couldn't ferry them really all that much more than that. If there are any redeeming features in here, well, I couldn't find them, quite frankly. No wonder AA's most frequent customers don't bother coming in here, they just huddle outside in Witherspoons instead. There are tubs of pasta shells, uh, something that got away from the chef, onions with shallots, uh, popular around here. Right, let's hit the booze. It is, quite frankly, the only way to cope. At least, uh, hmm. well, there are two bottles of wine. There used to be a separate wine rotunda in here, which I got to know very well in the 1990s and reviewed many, many times. But, oh, uh, that's gone too. Uh, and that's kind of it for entertainment in the lounge. There are some boiled sweets in the corner if you want that full happy eater experience. But that's just about it. The good thing is it's nice and quiet, but I don't want to curse a lounge with faint praise. No, it's doing a good enough job with that already. Um, I really did wonder if I'd gone down a rabbit hole and ended up in a 1990s with a weird tapestry of what aviation used to be like feeling. After all, the Lady of Shallots was forbidden to look directly at reality and was doomed to view the world through a mirror and weave that into what she saw as a tapestry. So if the shallots had got to me, I needed to escape the realms of the AA and get back to civilization. You know, I really need to work out my work-life balance because it just isn't working out for me lounging around in lounges all day. A different chair, by a different bar, each hour. I call it Game of Thrones. What I want to do is wipe myself clean of that antiseptic American experience and reached out to the Australians for some sanity in my last couple of hours. And some excellent wine, of course. Well, here we are, back where it started an amazing 26 hours ago. Seven One World lounges, a failed flight, an unexpected hotel visit, paid for thanks to BA, of course, and then back through the One World lounges. And now it looks as if my flight is finally prepared to board. Hopefully, they've screwed it together properly this time, and I might finally get on a flight. 
the end of champagne drinking is superb though it is hmm. and we need to get ready to board oh how wrong i was you know the phrase schadenfreude the pleasure derived by someone from another person's misfortune well after a while you hope that person's misfortune is going to get better yeah it didn't my luck didn't hold for me at the gate which pinged and the crew told me my beloved 1a was no longer mine and they had a different seat for me i was up front in business not that the crew told me i was being moved until i questioned why i was suddenly being shoved 23 rows backwards oh yes they replied i could claim the downgrade back from british airways but i needed to board quickly as my flight was now leaving from terminal 5. could my day two days trying to get this flight get any worse oh yes i was in terminal 3 as are 219 of what will soon become my closest friends. Thankfully this time, BA had laid on a fleet of buses to get us from the Terminal 3 gates to Terminal 5, where my A321 is now waiting for me and, come to that, everybody else who's been waiting over 24 hours to get it. Time for a nice scenic trip around the tunnels underlying Hounslow and then up to Terminal 5. In case you started to watch this video about 45 minutes ago and started to lose track of where I am, and indeed quite frankly the will to live, which is where I am at the moment, I was trying to take the short hop to Gothenburg, which I thought I'd be doing in some comfort. I must admit, I wasn't expecting to travel in economy and I haven't been in the back of BA's bus for a couple of decades now, so I was almost a bit curious as to what happens back here. Well, at least they give you a seat. But what's this? There's a menu, and apparently they expect you to buy stuff. Ooh, how quaint. Well, quite frankly, I'd rather this old crate would get us up in the air, as I've got a pub to get to in far distant Sweden. And there we go, up and over the Thames, and slowly climbing up to 35,000 feet to enjoy the delights of, oh, economy catering, or what British Airways like to call it, buy on board. Right, I guess I'd better reach for my Avios then. There are all sorts of delights on the menu, including the Red Snapper which I assumed the crew would know by heart. Oh, how raw. Oh, that's getting a bit hackneyed by now, isn't it? And yet I was amazed that the crew genuinely had no idea about the hike gin and the long bottom. It was in their trolley. It was there all along and they had no idea. I was starving too, having deliberately avoided most of the lounge food after having, last night, after so many hours at Heathrow, one of BA's famous delay dinners. That gave me a severe bout of the collie wobbles. But, needs must, and apparently back here, they can serve you up a ploughman's. But how ro- oh, that's enough now. It comes in a pretty box and has got two tubs of cheese and some olives on charcoal. At least the Red Snapper, which is gin over tomato juice, BA crew, please do take copious notes, went down very easily. And finally, there's Sweden. There's Gothenburg. And eventually, we make it down to the ground and the terminal. Yeah. 
It's amazing and a minor miracle as well. I've actually made it to Sweden. I'm here in Gothenburg Airport after having spent 28 hours flying here from London Heathrow. It's a minor miracle that I've made it and goodness I'm exhausted. Only problem is I've got to do the same thing all over again tomorrow and fly halfway around the world. <sighs> I do need a bit of sleep. But I made it to Gothenburg. I ticked off all seven lounges on one piece. No less than three flights scheduled for tomorrow, taking me to the other side of the globe have been rearranged. I made it on the bus into the city, and I finally made it to the pub. <laughs>